May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do? It's a rhetorical question that is naturally given to self-examination. But it's also one that has more to do with our relationship to God than we typically care to recognize. In fact, in fact, it reflects both the content and the quality of the dialogue that we all continue to engage in as we proceed to talk to God, and most specifically, when we choose to listen. Because there is always a reciprocal point of view in that conversation which inverts the what will I do with the godly inquiry that it is actually the response to. And what that is, is the voice of God asking you, what are you going to do? Because by his grace, he's created us with the freedom to make that choice and to decide what to do, even if what we decide to do is wrong. Or, as in this case, right, but according to a reason that's wrong. What are you going to do? It's God's great question to all of us. And it's one that all of us have to answer, too. And usually without having to take too much time to figure it out, the answer that God would like for us to give is all too obvious. It's just like giving candy to a child in a crowd of children who have none, but by all means would certainly like to. You begin with the hope that the favored one will choose to share. But the risk remains uncomfortably apparent to you that it is just as likely that he or she will callously decide to disregard the right thing to do in order to enjoy the juvenile version of what it means to be wealthy. The candy may be graciously given with the freedom to choose to do whatever one wants to do. But that doesn't mean that the obligation to be responsible has somehow evaporated into oblivion. And the more that a child grows into the moral maturity that he or she needs to in order to be the child of God that he or she is born to be, the more that that figures into what they finally choose to do. You see, the reality is that all of the possessions that we prefer to personally lay claim to are actually property that never really has and never really will belong to you or me or to any of us who choose to live our lives according to what essentially amounts to a narcissistic delusion. Whatever it is that we think that we have is just what's been graciously given to us by God for us to manage. And just because God is not given to a micromanagement point of view, it does not mean that the property is there for us to do with it anything that is in any way contradictory to what we're by our very creation obligated to do as the very children that fully and completely belong to God. In other words, whatever it is, it doesn't belong to you or to me. And the only reason that we have it in the first place is for us to do the good that we're called to do. 
by the Almighty God who gave it to us in order for us to do just that. Anything else is just us dishonestly choosing to do what is wrong and subsequently subject to the punitive judgment that is the consequence of the good that we don't do. Funny thing is, as long as we look for that judgment from a uniquely removed and distant supernatural point of view, we're going to have a typical tendency to ignore it. And when what we choose to do is not what we're obligated to do, that makes not doing it pretty easy. When we've got the goods and God doesn't seem to actively care what we do with them, then there's no real reason to choose to do otherwise. That is, other than that we know what we're supposed to do according to the generous compassion that we have all been universally called to in love. Something which both you and I know is pretty easy to ignore. But here's the thing. And it's something that is that this parable directly refers to regarding what we choose to do with what we have. Judgment has another avenue. And it doesn't require a miraculous manifestation of God to supervise us and how we perform as a manager of the property entrusted to us in order for its justice to be served. The generosity and acts of compassion that we choose to do tend to have a reciprocal effect among those with whom we choose to do them. And they can work their way back to us, most importantly, in those times in which we just so happen to be the ones who just so happen to need them. It's the Christian karma of the good that we do and the rewards of righteousness that are witnessed to in almost every faith tradition that is adhered to throughout the world. The justice of God most frequently reflects itself in how we choose to live with the person right in front of us. And generous compassion is where we need to start right then and there if we would have generosity and compassion to be shown to us. And sharing that stuff that doesn't belong to us, that stuff that God has entrusted to us, which would be everything that you and me think that we have, including you and me, that's what's required to begin to make that happen. God is a manager, and it's you and me and everyone that he has graciously given life to. But the measure of our performance is a customer service issue. Generosity is an interest that compounds for us according to our willingness to invest it in those who most truly need for us to. And more often than not, those are the people most vulnerable to what we choose to do or not to do with what's been entrusted to us, for us, to share. Compassion is a spiritual point of view, but it has a bottom line, too. What we do for the least of these is the final judgment of what we're called to do. And that, that in the end, is a simple and practical matter of what we choose to do. God has been unusually gracious to you no matter who you are or what you happen to have. Because everything that you are and whatever you happen to have is what God has generously entrusted to you. You know, that the, you know the love that you're called to do. And you know that when you do it, it has a tendency to make its way back to you. 
all that remains is what are you going to do? Do you have the courage for compassion? Or are you just too scared to live the life that's been entrusted to you? Choose wisely and share what it means to walk out of the grave of greed and fear and be the resurrection into eternal life of the body of Christ given for you, for you to give. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.